Outrageous, outspoken and unapologetic, little is off limits for comedian and actress Margaret Cho. My Korean name is Moran. Moran. It's the name of Kim Jong-il's production company. A pioneer in the world of comedy, Cho was one of the first Asian Americans to break into the mainstream. Finally, my girls have arrived! Three decades and numerous Grammy and Emmy nominations later, Cho is using her unique brand of comedy to lead the way for a new generation. I think it's really my greatest achievement to have inspired a new generation to take on Asian American entertainment. So I'm very proud of what I've been able to do. It's not all laughter and lighthearted fun. In the face of rising anti-Asian tensions, this child of Korean immigrants is a fierce champion of minority rights. It's a very strange thing to feel attacked because of your race. Like, it's not supposed to happen in America, yet we're the most racist country. Find out what she's all about as we chat with Margaret Cho on the latest episode of Talking Post. Margaret Cho, thanks very much for joining us. Welcome. How do you feel about being a pioneer in Asian American uh, entertainment? In the sense that, you know, you have all these Marvel movies, you know, Shang-Chi with uh, Asian American representation, and everyone says, wow, that's really great. Asian Americans have uh, come into their own now in entertainment. But you were doing that way before then. I think it's wonderful. I think it's, it's really exciting because people give me a lot of credit, too, for inspiring them. And so I think it's really my greatest achievement to have inspired a new generation to take on Asian American entertainment, comedy, stand-up comedy in particular. Um, people like Joel Kim Booster and Bo and Yang and Ali Wong, they, you know, they're like my children. So I'm very proud of what I've been able to do. I'm looking at your tattoos and uh, your, your t-shirt and your, your, the whole persona you have there. You're, you're actually the opposite, the polar opposite of what uh, people assume, you know, the Asian stereotype, you know, the model minority. How was that like growing up with uh, what I assume would be conservative uh, Korean parents? Well, my parents are conservative in some ways, but they're also very artistic in other ways. You know, my parents had a gay bookstore in the 70s and all the employees were heavily tattooed, but um, I definitely did have sort of an, a traditional upbringing in a lot of other ways too, because they wanted me to be um, educated. They wanted me to go to an Ivy League school and they were very into those dreams of aspirational whiteness that Asian American families often have. They want to have their kids go to an Ivy League school or Stanford. They want us to be doctors or lawyers, something that they can sort of, um, the, 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 uh, p positive like value of that, they can't be taken away by anything that having to do with my identity. Like the fact that I'm Asian American or woman or queer even could take away from that. You mentioned the term aspirational whiteness, uh, which I find uh, most interesting. Can you expand on that a little bit for the benefit of our viewers here? Aspirational whiteness is a very, uh, big deal for the generation that I grew up in. So this is like these, uh, the first generation or, or second generation after um, our parents came because they, you know, our parents came to America escaping war, um, really a lot of in incredible poverty and a lot of generational trauma to come here to have American children. They didn't want us to have accents so we didn't speak korean in the household i only learned korean later on as, as an adult um we uh were often given very white old lady names like margaret although i did, i i i had changed my name because i have a very north korean name my korean name is moran which is like so north korean it was um kim jong il's production company was he was a big film film fan and he made movies but it's it's like, uh, you know, there's a lot of Asians my age named Helen and Margaret and, and you know, the, those kinds of names, Eleanor. There's so many of those older white lady names. It's a kind of aspirational whiteness. You wanted your kids to go to an Ivy League school. You wanted to have them ride horses and play tennis and, and um, you know, have this sort of like white living kind of thing like which you know if you can be anything like 
you have to aspire to whiteness. So aspirational whiteness isn't um, a negative thing necessarily. It's more that we need to survive our own trauma. So we take on the dreams of other cultures because our culture has been so damaged. Let's talk about your comedy. You know, um, uh, in your part of the world, uh, more than uh, in our part of the world, uh, it's all about uh, wokeness now and being politically correct, saying the right things, you know, and then you get canceled if you don't. Now, uh, your brand of humor is very uh, bold, brash, brutal, I might say, unapologetic. How do you cope with that? How do you adapt, if you adapt at all? I think it's uh, what today's atmosphere is asking for is for us to be a little more thoughtful and nuanced in the way that we talk about certain subjects because um in the past you know racism homophobia sexism all these things that were really difficult were very commonplace in comedy but now the perspective is shifting and so we're asking comedians to be more thoughtful about what their words are saying and so i appreciate that i think it's really about oh God, being skillful right. and thoughtful because wow. i am politically progressive well even though i um like have very strong beliefs and and i really do also want to be a good comedian so there's a lot of challenges but i think it's just about trying to meet that challenge i, tr I just try my best is there a danger of self-censorship though toning yourself down yes so it's about trying to find a way to still present what I would like to do, um, but also uh, be mindful of the way times are changing or how this material will be viewed, hopefully will be still be viewed in 20 years or so. You know, um, it's, it's something that also helps to, to note that as an Asian American, queer female, there are a lot of subjects that I have a lot of freedom in that a uh, cisgender, white, heterosexual male, which is most of comedians in my industry are, um, wouldn't be able to say. So I think in that I do have a, an identity politics advantage, but still, you know, you, you do um, have to kind of m maybe walk in a, a very sort of like uh, kind of a rarefied air of minority. You know, it's like only buys you so much time and it's hard. You know, you're also a very passionate advocate for uh, uh, minority rights, but uh, how do you balance that? Because making fun of that, uh, there's a very fine line. It's tricky, but it's also like when I'm talking about my uh, family or talking about my Asian-ness, or being, um, you know, in this place, like in America now, we're dealing with a lot of anti-Asian hate crimes, anti-Asian American hate crimes daily. And it's really shocking and it's really um, traumatic. And it's something that the only way that I can find any way to have hope in it is to find the humor in it, which is really quite difficult to do actually, but that's my job to try. And so I think there it, it's really more um, like, you know, you, you have a, a responsibility to your community to present it in the way that is very um, meaningful and respectful, but at the same time, it has to be funny. So it's, it's a lot to, to do. Uh, there's been an explosion of that anti-Asian uh, uh, racism in the U.S., but it's nothing new. It's, it's always been around for a long time, al although it's much more in your face now. What was it like uh, uh, from your personal experience growing up with racism? How bad was it then and how bad is it now as an adult when you look at it? I think it was um, mostly when I was growing up, you know, it was different because it was more invisibility that was the racism. Like the fact that Asian Americans didn't exist at all in the media in any way. So I, uh, in the 80s, turned to Hong Kong cinema. I was a big fan of John Woo and all of his films that he made in Hong Kong and of course in America later. Um, then, um, you know, watching all of the category three Hong Kong films. Like I love all of those Hong Kong horror films and action films. And I think being able to see Asian people on the screen 
made a big difference for me just to know that we existed in that way. But that was also cinema from Asia. So it was different from I mean, Asian American television or Asian American film. There was just so little. So it was more dealing with that invisibility. And then, um, you know, now it's more uh, that there is more representation, but it's still relatively little compared to the mass massive amount of entertainment that comes out. But at least we sort of have a place there, especially in comedy. The uh, racism on the streets, can you give us an idea of what it's like? I mean, you're a famous person, you're a celebrity. When you walk on the streets, uh, do, you, do you feel comfortable? Uh, what's it like? Or do you have to keep looking over your shoulder? You do have to keep looking over your shoulder. I was actually in Florida and I was walking my dog and I accidentally um, walked into a, a convoy. It was a kind of a mask mandate protest. And it was about 30 uh, 18 wheeler trucks, really big trucks driving really aggressively down the street. I was the only person on the street and they were really honking at me really loud um, and following me for many, many, many blocks. And it was really threatening. And one of them actually almost ran us over. And I tried to get my phone out to get his license plate number, but he had taken his license plates off. So that's quite a dangerous thing to have like a 18 wheel truck with no license plate, like actually trying to get you like it's like a horror film. I mean, that, that's real. And that was only about a month ago. So those kinds of things are happening um, to Asian Americans, to people who are wearing masks. I, I just don't understand. Like they have all these like banners on their trucks that say, save the children. You know, like this is a bad example to show children what you're doing. You're not saving anybody. You're, you're using a lot of gas is what you're doing, which is very expensive. But it was really frightening. And I, I think like you just don't know what to do because it's a very strange thing to feel attacked because of your race. Like it, it's not supposed to happen in America, yet we are the most racist country. You do realize the, uh, the irony here. You know, uh, we live in this part of the world where you must be reading on the news about uh, loss of freedoms and uh, not, you know, human rights violations, that kind of stuff. You hear that narrative all the time, whereas you live in a free country. But here in Hong Kong, you know, if there is racism, there is racism, but the racism is more latent. It's more uh, passive, aggressive racism. You never have to worry. Anybody in Hong Kong doesn't have to worry about be being beaten up for the color of their skin. But then you have freedom <laughs> there. Uh, you have democracy there, but you have to walk on the streets in fear. I mean, how, what kind of life is that, right? It's real fear, and it's not just um, of trucks. I mean, we have, this is an unprecedented problem with guns, you know? So the way that we sort of present as this country that's about freedom and equality, yet we're killing kids, um, it's, it's really quite a nightmare. And I, I don't know exactly what it's gonna take to solve that problem. Um, it's been going on for many, many, many years now. And so, you know, we're dealing with a lot of problems here that um, really negate the idea of it, it is not the home of the brave. We're not brave at all in any of this. Well, some of you are brave like you, Margaret. I mean, you, 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 you champion uh, minorities' rights <laughs> a lot. Well, thank you. I do my best, I try, but you know, I'm not brave walking down the street with my tiny little dog, my, two kilo dog <laughs> do you have a sense of uh, defiance yes <laughs> you know my mission now is to understand us like to understand asians as americans and we've been here since the railroads i mean and our our story in american history has really been largely erased so i'm hoping to bring those stories to life whether it is like from 1849 on you know, chronicling all of these events, whether it's the Chinese Exclusion Act, whether it's the Japanese internment camps, you know, to the L.A. uprising after the Rodney King riots to now. So, you know, you want to sort of look at all these things and, and really remember that whenever America is in crisis, our Americanness comes into question. And so my constant, like, you know, impetus and like inspiration for writing is really thinking about those ideas and how cyclical the nature of 
violence against Asian Americans is. While there's been this explosion of anti-Asian American hate, at the same time, Hollywood has become a lot more accepting now, right? You have all Asian uh, American casts, for example. But it's, it's such a paradox that at the same time, then you also have to deal with racism on the streets. Yes, but it's really, I mean, on that level, it's getting better. The representation in television and film is getting a lot better. And also, you know, definitely in music, all of the arts, you know, that's really powerful. And it's only beginning. So I think that um, maybe we'll see more of a difference later. But the fact that, that we are seeing many more Asians and Asian Americans out there in entertainment does help. Your latest project is your new movie, right, uh, Fire Island. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? I watched the trailer. It looks most interesting. It looks like a lot of fun. It's a beautiful movie. It's a reimagining of Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen, but set uh, with gay Asian Americans on Fire Island Pride in 2022. And Pride and Prejudice with tattoos? Pride and Prejudice. Yes, with tattoos, with a lot of uh, gay romance. And it's a beautiful film. And I'm really in love with Joel Kim Booster with Bo and Yang, with uh, the director Andrew Ahn, with the entire cast, and they, they really did such a great job on the film, and it was an honor to be in it. Will you be touring uh, Asia with the movie sometime? Can we see you in this part of the I world? hope so. I would love that. I would love that. I miss it. So I would love to come back and um, come in and uh, hang out at the Chunking Mansions. Uh, oh, you know <laughs> Chunking so Mansions, all right. Yes, I love I love Hong Kong. I, I think it's set. I mean, to me, it's still the cinematic city of, uh, you know, Wong Kar Wai. And I, I just um, I really love being there. So I, I'm looking forward to coming back. All right, Margaret, thanks very much for your time. We've come to the end of our interview. But uh, I look at your tattoos again. I'm looking at your T-shirt again and I'm saying uh, Margaret Cho, rock on. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Real pleasure. Thank you.